volume two part two chapter twenty two of the ingenious gentleman don quixote of la mancha by miguel de cervantes saavedra translated by john ormsby eighteen twenty nine to eighteen ninety five this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume two part two chapter twenty two wherein is related the grand adventure of the cave of montesinos in the heart of la mancha which the valiant don quixote brought to a happy termination many and great were the attentions shown to don quixote by the newly married couple who felt themselves under an obligation to him for coming forward in defence of their cause and they exalted his wisdom to the same level with his courage rating him as a cid in arms and a cicero in eloquence worthy sancho enjoyed himself for three days at the expense of the pair from whom they learned that the sham wound was not a scheme arranged with the fair quiteria but a device of basilio's who counted on exactly the result they had seen he confessed it is true that he had confided his idea to some of his friends so that at the proper time they might aid him in his purpose and ensure the success of the deception that said don quixote is not and ought not to be called deception which aims at virtuous ends and the marriage of lovers he maintained to be a most excellent end reminding them however that love has no greater enemy than hunger and constant want for love is all gaiety enjoyment and happiness especially when the lover is in the possession of the object of his love and poverty and want are the declared enemies of all these which he said to urge senor basilio to abandon the practice of those accomplishments he was skilled in for though they brought him fame they brought him no money and apply himself to the acquisition of wealth by legitimate industry which will never fail those who are prudent and persevering the poor man who is a man of honour if indeed a poor man can be a man of honour has a jewel when he has a fair wife and if she is taken from him his honour is taken from him and slain the fair woman who is a woman of honour and whose husband is poor deserves to be crowned with the laurels and crowns of victory and triumph beauty by itself attracts the desires of all who behold it and the royal eagles and birds of towering flight stoop on it as on a dainty lure but if beauty be accompanied by want and penury then the ravens and the kites and other birds of prey assail it and she who stands firm against such attacks well deserves to be called the crown of her husband remember o prudent basilio added don quixote it was the opinion of a certain sage i know not whom that there was not more than one good woman in the whole world and his advice was that each one should think and believe that this one good woman was his own wife and in this way he would live happy i myself am not married nor so far has it ever entered my thoughts to be so nevertheless i would venture to give advice to any one who might ask it as to the mode in which he should seek a wife such as he would be content to marry the first thing i would recommend him would be to look to good name rather than to wealth for a good woman does not win a good name merely by being good but by letting it be seen that she is so and open looseness and freedom do much more damage to a woman's honour than secret depravity if you take a good woman into your house it will be an easy matter to keep her good and even to make her still better but if you take a bad one you will find it hard work to mend her for it is no very easy matter to pass from one extreme to another i do not say it is impossible but i look upon it as difficult sancho listening to all this said to himself this master of mine when i say anything that has weight and substance says i might take a pulpit in hand and go about the world preaching fine sermons but i say of him that when he begins stringing maxims together and giving advice not only might he take a pulpit in hand but two on each finger and go into the market-places to his heart's content devil take you for a knight-errant what a lot of things you know i used to think in my heart that the only thing he knew was what belonged to his chivalry but there is nothing he won't have a finger in sancho muttered this somewhat aloud and his master overheard him and asked what art thou muttering there sancho i'm not saying anything or muttering anything said sancho i was only saying to myself that i wish i had heard what your worship has said just now before i married perhaps i'd say now the ox that's loose licks himself well is thy teresa so bad then sancho she is not very bad replied sancho but she is not very good at least she is not as good as i could wish 
thou dost wrong sancho said don quixote to speak ill of thy wife for after all she is the mother of thy children we are quits returned sancho for she speaks ill of me whenever she takes it into her head especially when she is jealous and satan himself could not put up with her then in fine they remained three days with the newly married couple by whom they were entertained and treated like kings don quixote begged the fencing licentiate to find him a guide to show him the way to the cave of montesinos as he had a great desire to enter it and see with his own eyes if the wonderful tales that were told of it all over the country were true the licentiate said he would get him a cousin of his own a famous scholar and one very much given to reading books of chivalry who would have great pleasure in conducting him to the mouth of the very cave and would show him the lakes of ruidera which were likewise famous all over la mancha and even all over spain and he assured him he would find him entertaining for he was a youth who could write books good enough to be printed and dedicated to princes the cousin arrived at last leading an ass in foal with a pack saddle covered with a party-coloured carpet or sackcloth sancho saddled rocinante got dapple ready and stocked his alforjas along with which went those of the cousin likewise well filled and so commending themselves to god and bidding farewell to all they set out taking the road for the famous cave of montesinos on the way don quixote asked the cousin of what sort and character his pursuits avocations and studies were to which he replied that he was by profession a humanist and that his pursuits and studies were making books for the press all of great utility and no less entertainment to the nation one was called the book of liveries in which he described seven hundred and three liveries with their colours mottoes and ciphers from which gentlemen of the court might pick and choose any they fancied for festivals and revels without having to go a-begging for them from any one or puzzling their brains as the saying is to have them appropriate to their objects and purposes for said he i give the jealous the rejected the forgotten the absent what will suit them and fit them without fail i have another book too which i shall call metamorphoses or the spanish ovid one of rare and original invention for imitating ovid in burlesque style i show in it who the Giralda of seville and the angel of the magdalena were what the sower of visenguera at cordova was what the bulls of guisando the sierra morena the leganitos and levapis fountains at madrid not forgetting those of the piojo of the cano dorado and of the prioria and all with their allegories metaphors and changes so that they are amusing interesting and instructive all at once another book i have which i call the supplement to polydor virgil which treats of the invention of things and is a work of great erudition and research for i establish and elucidate elegantly some things of great importance which polydor omitted to mention he forgot to tell us who was the first man in the world that had a cold in his head and who was the first to try salivation for the french disease but i give it accurately set forth and quote more than five hundred and twenty authors in proof of it so you may perceive i have laboured to good purpose and that the book will be of service to the whole world sancho who had been very attentive to the cousin's words said to him tell me senor and god give you luck in printing your books can you tell me for of course you know as you know everything who was the first man that scratched his head for to my thinking it must have been our father adam so it must replied the cousin for there is no doubt but adam had a head and hair and being the first man in the world he would have scratched himself sometimes so i think said sancho but now tell me who was the first tumbler in the world really brother answered the cousin i could not at this moment say positively without having investigated it i will look it up when i go back to where i have my books and will satisfy you the next time we meet for this will not be the last time look here senor said sancho don't give yourself any trouble about it for i have just this minute hit upon what i asked you the first tumbler in the world you must know was lucifer when they cast or pitched him out of heaven for he came tumbling into the bottomless pit you are right friend said the cousin and said don quixote sancho that question and answer are not thine own thou hast heard them from some one else hold your peace senor said sancho faith if i take to asking questions and answering i'll go on from this till to-morrow morning nay to ask foolish things and answer nonsense i needn't go looking for help from my neighbours thou hast said more than thou art aware of sancho said don quixote 
for there are some who weary themselves out in learning and proving things that after they are known and proved are not worth a farthing to the understanding or memory in this and other pleasant conversation the day went by and that night they put up at a small hamlet whence it was not more than two leagues to the cave of montesinos so the cousin told don quixote adding that if he was bent upon entering it it would be requisite for him to provide himself with ropes so that he might be tied and lowered into its depths don quixote said that even if it reached to the bottomless pit he meant to see where it went to so they bought about a hundred fathoms of rope and next day at two in the afternoon they arrived at the cave the mouth of which is spacious and wide but full of thorn and wild fig bushes and brambles and briars so thick and matted that they completely close it up and cover it over on coming within sight of it the cousin sancho and don quixote dismounted and the first two immediately tied the ladder very firmly with the ropes and as they were girding and swathing him sancho said to him mind what you are about master mine don't go burying yourself alive or putting yourself where you'll be like a bottle put to cool in a well it's no affair or business of your worships to become the explorer of this which must be worse than a moorish dungeon tie me and hold thy peace said don quixote for an emprise like this friend sancho was reserved for me and said the guide i beg of you senor don quixote to observe carefully and examine with a hundred eyes everything that is within there perhaps there may be some things for me to put into my book of transformations the drum is in hands that will know how to beat it well enough said sancho panza when he had said this and finished the tying which was not over the armour but only over the doublet don quixote observed it was careless of us not to have provided ourselves with a small cattle bell to be tied on the rope close to me the sound of which would show that i was still descending and alive but as that is out of the question now in god's hand be it to guide me and forthwith he fell on his knees and in a low voice offered up a prayer to heaven imploring god to aid him and grant him success in this to all appearance perilous and untried adventure and then exclaimed aloud o mistress of my actions and movements illustrious and peerless dulcinea del toboso if so be the prayers and supplications of this fortunate lover can reach thy ears by thy incomparable beauty i entreat thee to listen to them for they but ask thee not to refuse me thy favour and protection now that i stand in such need of them i am about to precipitate to sink to plunge myself into the abyss that is here before me only to let the world know that while thou dost favour me there is no impossibility i will not attempt and accomplish with these words he approached the cavern and perceived that it was impossible to let himself down or effect an entrance except by sheer force or cleaving a passage so drawing his sword he began to demolish and cut away the brambles at the mouth of the cave at the noise of which a vast multitude of crows and chuffs flew out of it so thick and so fast that they knocked don quixote down and if he had been as much of a believer in augury as he was a catholic christian he would have taken it as a bad omen and declined to bury himself in such a place he got up however and as there came no more crows or night-birds like the bats that flew out at the same time with the crows the cousin and sancho giving him rope he lowered himself into the depths of the dread cavern and as he entered it sancho sent his blessing after him making a thousand crosses over him and saying god and the pena de francia and the trinity of gaeta guide thee flower and cream of knights errant there thou goest thou dare-devil of the earth heart of steel arm of brass once more god guide thee and send thee back safe sound and unhurt to the light of this world thou art leaving to bury thyself in the darkness thou art seeking there and the cousin offered up almost the same prayers and supplications don quixote kept calling to them to give him rope and more rope and they gave it out little by little and by the time the calls which came out of the cave as out of a pipe ceased to be heard they had let down the hundred fathoms of rope they were inclined to pull don quixote up again as they could give him no more rope however they waited about half an hour at the end of which time they began to gather in the rope again with great ease and without feeling any weight which made them fancy don quixote was remaining below and persuaded that it was so sancho wept bitterly and hauled away in great haste in order to settle the question when however they had come to as it seemed rather more than eighty fathoms they felt a weight at which they were greatly delighted 
and at last at ten fathoms more they saw don quixote distinctly and sancho called out to him saying welcome back senor for we had begun to think you were going to stop there to found a family but don quixote answered not a word and drawing him out entirely they perceived he had his eyes shut and every appearance of being fast asleep they stretched him on the ground and untied him but still he did not awake however they rolled him back and forwards and shook and pulled him about so that after some time he came to himself stretching himself just as if he were waking up from a deep and sound sleep and looking about him he said god forgive you friends ye have taken me away from the sweetest and most delightful existence and spectacle that ever human being enjoyed or beheld now indeed do i know that all the pleasures of this life pass away like a shadow and a dream or fade like the flower of the field o oh, ill-fated montesinos o oh, sore wounded durandarte o oh, unhappy balerma o oh, tearful guadiana and ye o oh, hapless daughters of ruidera who show in your waves the tears that flowed from your beauteous eyes the cousin and sancho panza listened with deep attention to the words of don quixote who uttered them as though with immense pain he drew them up from his very bowels they begged of him to explain himself and tell them what he had seen in that hell down there hell do you call it said don quixote call it by no such name for it does not deserve it as ye shall soon see he then begged them to give him something to eat as he was very hungry they spread the cousin's sackcloth on the grass and put the stores of the alforjas into requisition and all three sitting down lovingly and sociably they made a luncheon and a supper of it all in one and when the sackcloth was removed don quixote of la mancha said let no one rise and attend to me my sons both of you end of volume two part two chapter twenty two recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume two part two chapter twenty three of the ingenious gentleman don quixote of la mancha by miguel de cervantes saavedra translated by john ormsby eighteen twenty nine to eighteen ninety five this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume two part two chapter twenty three of the wonderful things the incomparable don quixote said he saw in the profound cave of montesinos the impossibility and magnitude of which caused this adventure to be deemed apocryphal it was about four in the afternoon when the sun veiled in clouds with subdued light and tempered beams enabled don quixote to relate without heat or inconvenience what he had seen in the cave of montesinos to his two illustrious hearers and he began as follows a matter of some twelve or fourteen times a man's height down in this pit on the right-hand side there is a recess or space roomy enough to contain a large cart with its mules a little light reaches it through some chinks or crevices communicating with it and open to the surface of the earth this recess or space i perceived when i was already growing weary and disgusted at finding myself hanging suspended by the rope travelling downwards into that dark region without any certainty or knowledge of where i was going so i resolved to enter it and rest myself for a while i called out telling you not to let out more rope until i bade you but you cannot have heard me i then gathered in the rope you were sending me and making a coil or pile of it i seated myself upon it ruminating and considering what i was to do to lower myself to the bottom having no one to hold me up and as i was thus deep in thought and perplexity suddenly and without provocation a profound sleep fell upon me and when i least expected it i know not how i awoke and found myself in the midst of the most beautiful delightful meadow that nature could produce or the most lively human imagination conceive i opened my eyes i rubbed them and found i was not asleep but thoroughly awake nevertheless i felt my head and breast to satisfy myself whether it was i myself who was there or some empty delusive phantom but touch feeling the collected thoughts that passed through my mind all convinced me that i was the same then and there that i am this moment next there presented itself to my sight a stately royal palace or castle with walls that seemed built of clear transparent crystal and through two great doors that opened wide therein i saw coming forth and advancing towards me a venerable old man 
clad in a long gown of mulberry-coloured serge that trailed upon the ground. On his shoulders and breast he had a green satin collegiate hood, and covering his head a black Milanese bonnet, and his snow-white beard fell below his girdle. He carried no arms whatever, nothing but a rosary of beads bigger than fair-sized filberts, each tenth bead being like a moderate ostrich egg. His bearing, his gait, his dignity and imposing presence held me spellbound and wondering. He approached me, and the first thing he did was to embrace me closely, and then he said to me, For a long time now, O valiant knight Don Quixote of La Mancha, we who are here enchanted in these solitudes have been hoping to see thee, that thou mayest make known to the world what is shut up and concealed in this deep cave, called the cave of Montesinos, which thou hast entered, an achievement reserved for thy invincible heart and stupendous courage alone to attempt. Come with me, illustrious sir and I will show thee the marvels hidden within this transparent castle, whereof I am the Alcaide and perpetual warden, for I am Montesinos himself, from whom the cave takes its name. The instant he told me he was Montesinos, I asked him if the story they told in the world above here was true, that he had taken out the heart of his great friend Durandarte from his breast with a little dagger, and carried it to the Lady Belerma, as his friend when at the point of death had commanded him he said in reply that they spoke the truth in every respect except as to the dagger for it was not a dagger nor little but a burnished poniard sharper than an awl that poniard must have been made by ramon de jose the civilian said sancho i do not know said don quixote it could not have been by that poniard maker however because ramon de jose was a man of yesterday and the affair of roncesvalles where this mishap occurred was long ago but the question is of no great importance, nor does it affect or make any alteration in the truth or substance of the story. That is true, said the cousin. Continue, Señor Don Quixote, for I am listening to you with the greatest pleasure in the world. And with no less do I tell the tale, said Don Quixote, and so to proceed, the venerable Montesinos led me into the Palace of Crystal, where in a lower chamber, strangely cool and entirely of alabaster, was an elaborately wrought marble tomb, upon which I beheld, stretched at full length, a knight, not of bronze or marble or jasper, as are seen on other tombs, but of actual flesh and blood. His right hand, which seemed to me somewhat hairy and sinewy, a sign of great strength in its owner, lay on the side of his heart. But before I could put any question to Montesinos, he, seeing me gazing at the tomb in amazement, said to me, This is my friend Durandarte flower and mirror of the true lovers and valiant knights of his time he is held enchanted here as i myself and many others are by that french enchanter merlin who they say was the devil's son but my belief is not that he was the devil's son but that he knew as the saying is a point more than the devil how or why he enchanted us no one knows but time will tell and i suspect that time is not far off what i marvel at is that i know it to be as sure as that it is now day that durandarte ended his life in my arms and that after his death i took out his heart with my own hands and indeed it must have weighed more than two pounds for according to naturalists he who has a large heart is more largely endowed with valour than he who has a small one then as this is the case and as the knight did really die how comes it that he now moans and sighs from time to time as if he were still alive. As he said this, the wretched Durandarte cried out in a loud voice, O cousin Montesinos, t'was my last request of thee, when my soul hath left the body, and that lying dead I be, with thy poniard or thy dagger cut the heart from out my breast, and bear it to Belerma, this was my last request. On hearing which, the venerable Montesinos fell on his knees before the unhappy knight, and with tearful eyes exclaimed long since senor durandarte my beloved cousin long since have i done what thou bade me on that sad day when i lost you i took out your heart as well as i could not leaving an atom of it in your breast i wiped it with a lace handkerchief and i took the road to france with it having first laid you in the bosom of the earth with tears enough to wash and cleanse my hands of the blood that covered them after wandering among your bowels and more by token, O cousin of my soul, at the first village I came to after leaving Roncesvalles, I sprinkled a little salt upon your heart to keep it sweet, and bring it, if not fresh, at least pickled, into the presence of the Lady Belerma, whom, together with you, myself, 
Guadiana, your squire, the duenna Ruidera, and her seven daughters and two nieces, and many more of your friends and acquaintances. The sage Merlin has been keeping enchanted here these many years. And although more than five hundred have gone by, not one of us has died. Ruidera and her daughters and nieces alone are missing, and these because of the tears they shed, Merlin, out of the compassion he seems to have felt for them, changed into so many lakes, which to this day in the world of the living, and in the province of La Mancha, are called the lakes of Ruidera. The seven daughters belong to the kings of Spain, and the two nieces to the knights of a very holy order, called the Order of St. John. Guadiana, your squire, likewise bewailing your fate, was changed into a river of his own name. But when he came to the surface and beheld the sun of another heaven, so great was his grief at finding he was leaving you that he plunged into the bowels of the earth. However, as he cannot help following his natural course, he from time to time comes forth and shows himself to the sun and the world. The lakes aforesaid send him their waters, and with these and others that come to him, he makes a grand and imposing entrance into Portugal. But for all that, go where he may, he shows his melancholy and sadness, and takes no pride in breeding dainty choice fish, only coarse and tasteless sorts, very different from those of the golden tagus. All this that I tell you now, O oh cousin mine, I have told you many times before, and as you make no answer, I fear that either you believe me not, or do not hear me, whereat I feel God knows what grief. I have now news to give you, which, if it serves not to alleviate your sufferings, will not in any wise increase them. Know that you have here before you, open your eyes and you will see, that great knight of whom the sage Merlin has prophesied such great things, that Don Quixote of La Mancha, I mean, who has again, and to better purpose than in past times, revived in these days knight errantry, long since forgotten, and by whose intervention and aid it may be we shall be disenchanted, for great deeds are reserved for great men. And if that may not be, said the wretched Durandarte in a low and feeble voice, if that may not be then, my cousin, I say patience and shuffle. And turning over on his side, he relapsed into his former silence without uttering another word. And now there was heard a great outcry and lamentation, accompanied by deep sighs and bitter sobs. I looked round, and through the crystal wall I saw passing through another chamber a procession of two lines of fair damsels all clad in mourning, and with white turbans of Turkish fashion on their heads. Behind, in the rear of these, there came a lady, for so from her dignity she seemed to be, also clad in black, with a white veil so long and ample that it swept the ground. Her turban was twice as large as the largest of any of the others. Her eyebrows met, her nose was rather flat, her mouth was large but with ruddy lips, and her teeth, of which at times she allowed a glimpse, were seen to be sparse and ill-set, though as white as peeled almonds. She carried in her hands a fine cloth, and in it, as well as I could make out, a heart that had been mummied, so parched and dried was it. Montesinos told me that all those forming the procession were the attendants of Durandarte and Balerma, who were enchanted there with their master and mistress, and that the last, she who carried the heart in the cloth, was the Lady Balerma, who, with her damsels, four days in the week went in procession singing, or rather weeping, dirges over the body and miserable heart of his cousin, and that if she appeared to me somewhat ill-favoured or not so beautiful as fame reported her, it was because of the bad nights and worse days that she passed in that enchantment, as I could see by the great dark circles round her eyes and her sickly complexion, her sallowness and the rings round her eyes, said he, are not caused by the periodical ailment usual with women, for it is many months and even years since she has had any, but by the grief her own heart suffers because of that which she holds in her hand perpetually, and which recalls and brings back to her memory the sad fate of her lost lover. Were it not for this, hardly would the great Dulcinea del Toboso, so celebrated in all these parts, and even in the world, come up to her for beauty, grace, and gaiety." hold hard said i at this tell your story as you ought senor don montesinos for you know very well that all comparisons are odious and there is no occasion to compare one person with another the peerless dulcinea del toboso is what she is and the lady doña Dalerma is what she is and has been and that's enough to which he made answer forgive me senor don quixote 
I own I was wrong, and spoke unadvisedly in saying that the Lady Dulcinea could scarcely come up to the Lady Belerma, for it were enough for me to have learned, by what means I know not, that you are her knight, to make me bite my tongue out before I compared her to anything save heaven itself after this apology which the great montesinos made me my heart recovered itself from the shock i had received in hearing my lady compared with balerma still i wonder said sancho that your worship did not get upon the old fellow and bruise every bone of him with kicks and pluck his beard until you didn't leave a hair in it nay sancho my friend said don quixote it would not have been right in me to do that for we are all bound to pay respect to the aged even though they be not knights but especially to those who are and who are enchanted i only know i gave him as good as he brought in the many other questions and answers we exchanged i cannot understand senor don quixote remarked the cousin here how it is that your worship in such a short space of time as you have been below there could have seen so many things and said and answered so much how long is it since i went down asked don quixote little better than an hour replied sancho that cannot be returned don quixote because night overtook me while i was there and day came and it was night again and day again three times so that by my reckoning i have been three days in those remote regions beyond our ken my master must be right replied sancho for as everything that has happened to him is by enchantment maybe what seems to us an hour would seem three days and nights there that's it said don quixote and did your worship eat anything all that time senor asked the cousin i never touched a morsel answered don quixote nor did i feel hunger or think of it and do the enchanted eat said the cousin they neither eat said don quixote nor are they subject to the greater excrements though it is thought that their nails beards and hair grow and do the enchanted sleep now senor asked sancho certainly not replied don quixote at least during those three days i was with them not one of them closed an eye nor did i either the proverb tell me what company thou keepest and i'll tell thee what thou art is to the point here said sancho your worship keeps company with enchanted people that are always fasting and watching what wonder is it then that you neither eat nor sleep while you are with them but forgive me senor if i say that of all this you have told us now may god take me i was just going to say the devil if i believe a single particle what said the cousin has senor don quixote then been lying why even if he wished it he has not had time to imagine and put together such a host of lies i don't believe my master lies said sancho if not what dost thou believe asked don quixote i believe replied sancho that this merlin or those enchanters who enchanted the whole crew your worship says you saw and discoursed with down there stuffed your imagination or your mind with all this rigmarole you have been treating us to and all that is still to come well that might be sancho replied don quixote but it is not so for everything that i have told you i saw with my own eyes and touched with my own hands but what will you say when i tell you now how among the countless other marvellous things montesinos showed me of which at leisure and at the proper time i will give thee an account in the course of our journey for they would not be all in place here he showed me three country girls who went skipping and capering like goats over the pleasant fields there in the instant i beheld them i knew one to be the peerless dulcinea del toboso and the other two those same country girls that were with her and that we spoke to on the road from el toboso i asked montesinos if he knew them and he told me he did not but he thought they must be some enchanted ladies of distinction for it was only a few days before that that they had made their appearance in those meadows but i was not to be surprised at that because there were a great many other ladies there of times past and present enchanted in various strange shapes and among them he had recognized queen guinevere and her dame quintanona she who poured out the wine for launcelot when he came from britain when sancho panza heard his master say this he was ready to take leave of his senses or die with laughter for as he knew the real truth about the pretended enchantment of dulcinea in which he himself had been the enchanter and concocter of all the evidence he made up his mind at last that beyond all doubt his master was out of his wits and stark mad so he said to him it was an evil hour a worse season and a sorrowful day when your worship dear master mine went down to the other world and an unlucky moment when you met with senor montesinos who has sent you back to us like this you were well enough here above in your full senses such as god had given you 
delivering maxims and giving advice at every turn, and not as you are now, talking the greatest nonsense that can be imagined. As I know thee, Sancho, said Don Quixote, I heed not thy words. Nor I your worship, said Sancho, whether you beat me or kill me for those I have spoken, and will speak if you don't correct and mend your own. But tell me, while we are still at peace, how or by what did you recognize the lady our mistress? And if you spoke to her, what did you say, and what did she answer? I recognized her, said Don Quixote, by her wearing the same garment she wore when thou didst point her out to me. I spoke to her, but she did not utter a word in reply. On the contrary, she turned her back on me and took to flight, at such a pace that crossbow bolt could not have overtaken her. I wished to follow her, and would have done so had not Montesinos recommended me not to take the trouble, as it would be useless, particularly as the time was drawing near when it be necessary for me to quit the cavern. He told me, moreover, that in course of time he would let me know how he and Belerma and Durandarte and all who were there were to be disenchanted. But of all I saw and observed down there, what gave me most pain was that while Montesinos was speaking to me, one of the two companions of the hapless Dulcinea approached me without my having seen her coming, and with tears in her eyes said to me in a low, agitated voice, My lady Dulcinea del Toboso kisses your worship's hands, and entreats you to do her the favour of letting her know how you are, and, being in great need, she also entreats your worship as earnestly as she can, to be so good as to lend her half a dozen reals, or as much as you may have about you, on this new dimity petticoat that I have here, and she promises to repay them very speedily. I was amazed and taken aback by such a message, and turning to Señor Montesinos, I asked him, Is it possible, Señor Montesinos, that persons of distinction under enchantment can be in need? To which he replied, Believe me, Señor Don Quixote, that which is called need is to be met with everywhere, and penetrates all quarters and reaches every one, and does not spare even the enchanted. And as the Lady Dulcinea del Toboso sends to beg those six reals, and the pledge is to all appearance a good one, there is nothing for it but to give them to her, for no doubt she must be in some great strait. I will take no pledge of her, I replied, nor yet can I give her what she asks, for all I have is four reals, which I gave, they were those which thou, Sancho, gavest me the other day, to bestow in alms upon the poor I met along the road. And I said, Tell your mistress, my dear, that I am grieved to the heart because of her distresses, and wish I was a fucar to remedy them, and that I would have her know that I cannot be and ought not to be in health while deprived of the happiness of seeing her, and enjoying her discreet conversation and that I implore her as earnestly as I can to allow herself to be seen and addressed by this her captive servant and forlorn knight. Tell her, too, that when she least expects it, she will hear it announced that I have made an oath and vow, after the fashion of that which the Marquis of Mantua made, to avenge his nephew Baldwin, when he found him at the point of death in the heart of the mountains, which was not to eat bread off a tablecloth and other trifling matters which he added until he had avenged him and I will make the same, to take no rest, and to roam the seven regions of the earth more thoroughly than the Infante Don Pedro of Portugal ever roamed them, until I have disenchanted her. All that and more you owe my lady, the damsel's answer to me, and taking the four reals, instead of making me a curtsy, she cut a caper, springing two full yards into the air. Oh, blessed God, exclaimed Sancho at this, is it possible that such things can be in the world? and that enchanters and enchantments can have such power in it as to have changed my master's right senses into a craze so full of absurdity oh senor senor for god's sake consider yourself have a care for your honour and give no credit to this silly stuff that has left you scant and short of wits thou talkest in this way because thou lovest me sancho said don quixote and not being experienced in the things of the world everything that has some difficulty about it seems to thee impossible but time will pass as i said before and i will tell thee some of the things i saw down there which will make thee believe what i have related now the truth of which admits of neither reply nor question end of volume two part two chapter twenty three recording by expatriate in bangor maine Volume Two, Part Two, Chapter Twenty Four, of the Ingenious Gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, 
translated by John Ormsby, 1829 to 1895. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 24. Wherein are related a thousand trifling matters as trivial as they are necessary to the right understanding of this great history. He who translated this great history from the original, written by its first author, Seed Hamet Benengeli, says that on coming to the chapter giving the adventures of the cave of Montesinos, he found written on the margin of it, in Hamet's own hand, these exact words. Quote, I cannot convince or persuade myself that everything that is written in the preceding chapter could have precisely happened to the valiant Don Quixote, and for this reason, that all the adventures that have occurred up to the present have been possible and probable. But as for this one of the cave, I see no way of accepting it as true, as it passes all reasonable bounds. For me to believe that Don Quixote could lie, he being the most truthful gentleman and the noblest knight of his time, is impossible. He would not have told a lie, though he were shot to death with arrows. On the other hand, I reflect that he related and told the story with all the circumstances detailed, and that he could not in so short a space have fabricated such a vast complication of absurdities. If, then, this adventure seems apocryphal, it is no fault of mine. And so, without affirming its falsehood or its truth, I write it down. Decide for thyself in thy wisdom, reader, for I am not bound, nor is it in my power to do more though certain it is they say that at the time of his death he retracted and said he had invented it thinking it matched and tallied with the adventures he had read of in his histories End quote. and then he goes on to say the cousin was amazed as well at sancho's boldness as at the patience of his master and concluded that the good temper the latter displayed arose from the happiness he felt at having seen his lady dulcinea even enchanted as she was because otherwise the words and language Sancho had addressed to him deserved a thrashing, for indeed he seemed to him to have been rather impudent to his master, to whom he now observed, I, Señor Don Quixote of La Mancha, look upon the time I have spent in travelling with your worship as very well employed, for I have gained four things in the course of it. The first is that I have made your acquaintance, which I consider great good fortune. The second, that I have learned what the cave of Montesinos contains, together with the transformations of Guadiana and of the lakes of Ruidera, which will be of use to me for the Spanish Ovid that I have in hand. The third, to have discovered the antiquity of cards, that they were in use at least in the time of Charlemagne, as may be inferred from the words you say Durandarte uttered, when, at the end of that long spell while Montesinos was talking to him, he woke up and said, Patience and shuffle. This phrase and expression he could not have learned while he was enchanted, but only before he had become so in France, and in the time of the aforesaid Emperor Charlemagne. And this demonstration is just the thing for me for that other book I am writing, the supplement to Polydor Virgil on the invention of antiquities, for I believe he never thought of inserting that of cards in his book as I mean to do in mine, and it will be a matter of great importance, particularly when I can cite so grave and voracious an authority as Signor Dorandarte. And the fourth thing is, that I have ascertained the source of the river Guadiana, heretofore unknown to mankind. You are right, said Don Quixote, but I should like to know, if by God's favour they grant you a license to print those books of yours, which I doubt, to whom do you mean to dedicate them? There are lords and grandes in Spain to whom they can be dedicated, said the cousin. Not many, said Don Quixote, not that they are unworthy of it, but because they do not care to accept books and incur the obligation of making the return that seems due to the author's labour and courtesy. One prince I know who makes up for all the rest, and more, how much more, if I ventured to say, perhaps I should stir up envy in many a noble breast. But let this stand over for some more convenient time, and let us go and look for some place to shelter ourselves in to-night. Not far from this, said the cousin, there is a hermitage, where there lives a hermit, who they say was a soldier, and who has the reputation of being a good Christian, and a very intelligent and charitable man. Close to the hermitage he has a small house, which he built at his own cost, but though small it is large enough for the reception of guests. Has this hermit any hens, do you think? asked Sancho. Few hermits are without them, said Don Quixote, for those we see nowadays are not like the hermits of the Egyptian deserts, who were clad in palm leaves and lived on the roots of the earth. 
but do not think that by praising these i am disparaging the others all i mean to say is that the penances of those of the present day do not come up to the asceticism and austerity of former times but it does not follow from this that they are not all worthy at least i think them so and at the worst the hypocrite who pretends to be good does less harm than the open sinner at this point they saw approaching the spot where they stood a man on foot proceeding at a rapid pace and beating a mule loaded with lances and halberds when he came up to them he saluted them and passed on without stopping don quixote called to him stay good fellow you seem to be making more haste than suits that mule i cannot stop senor answered the man for the arms you see i carry here are to be used to-morrow so i must not delay god be with you but if you want to know what i am carrying them for i mean to lodge to-night at the inn that is beyond the hermitage and if you be going the same road you will find me there and i will tell you some curious things once more god be with you and he urged on his mule at such a pace that don quixote had no time to ask him what these curious things were that he meant to tell them and as he was somewhat inquisitive and always tortured by his anxiety to learn something new he decided to set out at once and go and pass the night at the inn instead of stopping at the hermitage where the cousin would have had them halt accordingly they mounted and all three took the direct road for the inn which they reached a little before nightfall on the road the cousin proposed they should go up to the hermitage to drink a sup the instant sancho heard this he steered his dapple towards it and don quixote and the cousin did the same but it seems sancho's bad luck so ordered it that the hermit was not at home for so a sub-hermit they found in the hermitage told them they called for some of the best she replied that her master had none but that if they liked cheap water she would give it with great pleasure if i found any in water said sancho there are wells along the road where i could have had enough of it ah camacho's wedding and plentiful house of don diego how often do i miss you leaving the hermitage they pushed on towards the inn and a little farther they came upon a youth who was pacing along in front of them at no great speed so that they overtook him he carried a sword over his shoulder and slung on it a budget or bundle of his clothes apparently probably his breeches or pantaloons and his cloak and a shirt or two for he had on a short jacket of velvet with a gloss like satin on it in places and had his shirt out his stockings were of silk and his shoes square-toed as they wear them at court his age might have been eighteen or nineteen he was of a merry countenance and to all appearance of an active habit and he went along singing seguidillas to beguile the wearisomeness of the road as they came up with him he was just finishing one which the cousin got by heart and they say ran thus i'm off to the wars for the want of pence so had i but money i'd show more sense the first to address him was don quixote who said you travel very airily sir gallant whither bound may we ask if it is your pleasure to tell us to which the youth replied the heat and my poverty are the reason of my travelling so airily and it is to the wars that i am bound how poverty asked don quixote the heat one can understand senor replied the youth in this bundle i carry velvet pantaloons to match this jacket if i wear them out on the road i shall not be able to make a decent appearance in them in the city and i have not the wherewithal to buy others and so for this reason as well as to keep myself cool i am making my way in this fashion to overtake some companies of infantry that are not twelve leagues off in which i shall enlist and there will be no want of baggage trains to travel with after that to the place of embarkation which they say will be cartagena i would rather have the king for a master and serve him in the wars than serve a court pauper and did you get any bounty now asked the cousin if i had been in the service of some grande of spain or personage of distinction replied the youth i should have been safe to get it for that is the advantage of serving good masters that out of the servants hall men come to be ancients or captains or get a good pension but i to my misfortune always served place hunters and adventurers whose keep and wages were so miserable and scanty that half went in paying for the starching of one's collars it would be a miracle indeed if a page volunteer ever got anything like a reasonable bounty and tell me for heaven's sake asked don quixote is it possible my friend that all the time you served you never got any livery they gave me two replied the page but just as when one quits a religious community before making profession they strip him of the dress of the order and give him back his own clothes so did my masters return me mine for as soon as the business on which they came to court was finished 
they went home and took back the liveries they had given merely for show what spilorseria as an italian would say said don quixote but for all that consider yourself happy in having left court with as worthy an object as you have for there is nothing on earth more honourable or profitable than serving first of all god and then one's king and natural lord particularly in the profession of arms by which if not more wealth at least more honour is to be won than by letters as i have said many a time for though letters may have founded more great houses than arms still those founded by arms have i know not what superiority over those founded by letters and a certain splendour belonging to them that distinguishes them above all and bear in mind what i am now about to say to you for it will be of great use and comfort to you in time of trouble it is not to let your mind dwell on the adverse chances that may befall you for the worst of all is death and if it be a good death the best of all is to die they asked julius caesar the valiant roman emperor what was the best death he answered that which is unexpected which comes suddenly and unforeseen and though he answered like a pagan and one without the knowledge of the true god yet as far as sparing our feelings is concerned he was right for suppose you are killed in the first engagement or skirmish whether by a cannon-ball or blown up by mine what matters it it is only dying and all is over and according to terence a soldier shows better dead in battle than alive and safe in flight and the good soldier wins fame in proportion as he is obedient to his captains and those in command over him and remember my son that it is better for the soldier to smell of gunpowder than of civet and that if old age should come upon you in this honourable calling though you may be covered with wounds and crippled and lame it will not come upon you without honour and that such as poverty cannot lessen especially now that provisions are being made for supporting and relieving old and disabled soldiers for it is not right to deal with them after the fashion of those who set free and get rid of their black slaves when they are old and useless and turning them out of their houses under the pretence of making them free make them slaves to hunger from which they cannot expect to be released except by death but for the present i won't say more than get ye up behind me on my horse as far as the inn and sup with me there and to-morrow you shall pursue your journey and god give you as good speed as your intentions deserve the page did not accept the invitation to mount though he did that to supper at the inn and here they say sancho said to himself god be with you for a master is it possible that a man who can say things so many and so good as he has said just now can say that he saw the impossible absurdities he reports about the cave of montesinos well well we shall see and now just as night was falling they reached the inn and it was not without satisfaction that sancho perceived his master took it for a real inn and not for a castle as usual the instant they entered don quixote asked the landlord after the man with the lances and halberds and was told that he was in the stable seeing to his mule which was what sancho and the cousin proceeded to do for their beasts giving the best manger and the best place in the stable to rocinante End of volume two, part two, chapter twenty four. Recording by expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume two, part two, chapter twenty five. Of the ingenious gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby, eighteen twenty nine to eighteen ninety five. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 25. Wherein is set down the braying adventure, and the droll one of the puppet showman, together with the memorable divinations of the divining ape. Don Quixote's bread would not bake, as the common saying is, until he had heard and learned the curious thing promised by the man who carried the arms. He went to seek him where the innkeeper said he was, and having found him, bade him say now at any rate what he had to say, in answer to the question he had asked him on the road. The tale of my wonders must be taken more leisurely and not standing, said the man. Let me finish foddering my beast, good sir, and then I'll tell you things that will astonish you. Don't wait for that, said Don Quixote. I'll help you in everything. And so he did, sifting the barley for him and cleaning out the manger a degree of humility which made the other feel bound to tell him with a good grace what he had asked so seating himself on a bench with don quixote beside him and the cousin the page sancho panza and the landlord for a senate and an audience he began his story in this way 
you must know that in a village four leagues and a half from this inn it so happened that one of the regidors by the tricks and roguery of a servant girl of his it's too long a tale to tell lost an ass and though he did all he possibly could to find it it was all to no purpose a fortnight might have gone by so the story goes since the ass had been missing when as the regidor who had lost it was standing in the plaza another regidor of the same town said to him pay me for good news gossip your ass has turned up that i will and well gossip said the other but tell us where has he turned up in the forest said the finder i saw him this morning without pack saddle or harness of any sort and so lean that it went to one's heart to see him i tried to drive him before me and bring him to you but he is already so wild and shy that when i went near him he made off into the thickest part of the forest if you have a mind that we two should go back and look for him let me put up this she-ass at my house and i'll be back at once you will be doing me a great kindness said the owner of the ass and i'll try to pay it back in the same coin it is with all these circumstances and in the very same way i am telling it now that those who know all about the matter tell the story well then the two regidors set off on foot arm in arm for the forest and coming to the place where they hoped to find the ass they could not find him nor was he to be seen anywhere about search as they might seeing then that there was no sign of him the regidor who had seen him said to the other look here gossip a plan has occurred to me by which beyond a doubt we shall manage to discover the animal even if he is stowed away in the bowels of the earth not to say the forest here it is i can bray to perfection and if you can ever so little the thing's as good as done ever so little did you say gossip said the other by god i'll not give in to anybody not even to the asses themselves we'll soon see said the second regidor for my plan is that you should go one side of the forest and i the other so as to go all round about it and every now and then you will bray and i will bray and it cannot be but that the ass will hear us and answer us if he is in the forest to which the owner of the ass replied it's an excellent plan i declare gossip and worthy of your great genius and the two separating as agreed it so fell out that they brayed almost at the same moment and each deceived by the braying of the other ran to look fancying the ass had turned up at last when they came in sight of one another said the loser is it possible gossip that it was not my ass that brayed no it was i said the other well then i can tell you gossip said the ass's owner that between you and an ass there is not an atom of difference as far as braying goes for i never in all my life saw or heard anything more natural those praises and compliments belong to you more justly than to me gossip said the inventor of the plan for by the god that made me you might give a couple of brays odds to the best and most finished brayer in the world the tone you have got is deep your voice is well kept up as to time and pitch and your finishing notes come thick and fast in fact i own myself beaten and yield the palm to you and give in to you in this rare accomplishment well then said the owner i'll set a higher value on myself for the future and consider that i know something as i have an excellence of some sort for though i always thought i brayed well i never supposed i came up to the pitch of perfection you say and i say too said the second that there are rare gifts going to loss in the world and that they are ill bestowed upon those who don't know how to make use of them ours said the owner of the ass unless it is in cases like this we have now in hand cannot be of any service to us and even in this god grant they may be of some use so saying they separated and took to their braying once more but every instant they were deceiving one another and coming to meet one another again until they arranged by way of countersign so as to know that it was they and not the ass to give two brays one after the other in this way doubling the brays at every step they made the complete circuit of the forest but the lost ass never gave them an answer or even the sign of one how could the poor ill-starred brute have answered when in the thickest part of the forest they found him devoured by wolves as soon as he saw him his owner said i was wondering he did not answer for if he wasn't dead he'd have brayed when he heard us or he'd have been no ass but for the sake of having heard you bray to such perfection gossip i count the trouble i have taken to look for him well bestowed even though i have found him dead it's in a good hand gossip said the other if the abbot sings well the acolyte is not much behind him so they returned disconsolate and hoarse to their village where they told their friends neighbours and acquaintances what had befallen them in their search for the ass each crying up the other's perfection in braying 
the whole story came to be known and spread abroad through the villages of the neighbourhood and the devil who never sleeps with his love for sowing dissensions and scattering discord everywhere blowing mischief about and making quarrels out of nothing contrived to make the people of the other towns fall to braying whenever they saw any one from our village as if to throw the braying of our regidors in our teeth then the boys took to it which was the same thing for it as getting into the hands and mouths of all the devils of hell and braying spread from one town to another in such a way that the men of the braying town are as easy to be known as blacks are to be known from whites and the unlucky joke has gone so far that several times the scoffed have come out in arms and in a body to do battle with the scoffers and neither king nor rook fear nor shame can mend matters to-morrow or the day after i believe the men of my town that is of the braying town are going to take the field against another village two leagues away from ours one of those that persecute us most and that we may turn out well prepared i have bought these lances and halberds you have seen these are the curious things i told you i had to tell and if you don't think them so i have got no others and with this the worthy fellow brought his story to a close just at this moment there came in at the gate of the inn a man entirely clad in chamois leather hose breeches and doublet who said in a loud voice senor host have you room here's the divining ape and the show of the release of melisendra just coming odds body said the landlord why it's master pedro we're in for a grand night i forgot to mention that the said master pedro had his left eye and nearly half his cheek covered with a patch of green taffety showing that something ailed all that side your worship is welcome master pedro continued the landlord but where are the ape and the show for i don't see them they are close at hand said he in the chamois leather but i came on first to know if there was any room i'd make the duke of alva himself clear out to make room for master pedro said the landlord bring in the ape and the show there's company in the inn to-night that will pay to see that and the cleverness of the ape so be it by all means said the man with the patch i'll lower the price and be well satisfied if i only pay my expenses and now i'll go back and hurry on the cart with the ape and the show and with this he went out of the inn don quixote at once asked the landlord what this master pedro was and what was the show and what was the ape he had with him which the landlord replied this is a famous puppet showman who for some time past has been going about this mancha de aragon exhibiting a show of the release of melisendra by the famous don gaiferos one of the best and best represented stories that have been seen in this part of the kingdom for many a year he has also with him an ape with the most extraordinary gift ever seen in an ape or imagined in a human being for if you ask him anything he listens attentively to the question and then jumps on his master's shoulder and pressing close to his ear tells him the answer which master pedro then delivers he says a great deal more about things past than about things to come and though he does not always hit the truth in every case most times he is not far wrong so that he makes us fancy he has got the devil in him he gets two reals for every question if the ape answers i mean if his master answers for him after he has whispered into his ear and so it is believed that this same master pedro is very rich he is a gallant man as they say in italy and good company and leads the finest life in the world talks more than six drinks more than a dozen and all by his tongue and his ape and his show master pedro now came back and in a cart followed the show and the ape a big one without a tail and with buttocks as bare as felt but not vicious looking as soon as don quixote saw him he asked him can you tell me sir fortune teller what fish do we catch and how will it be with us see here are my two reals and he bade sancho give them to master pedro but he answered for the ape and said senor this animal does not give any answer or information touching things that are to come of things past he knows something and more or less of things present gad said sancho i would not give a farthing to be told what's past with me for who knows that better than i do myself and to pay for being told what i know would be mighty foolish but as you know things present here are my two reals and tell me most excellent sir ape what is my wife teresa panza doing now and what is she diverting herself with master pedro refused to take the money saying i will not receive payment in advance or until the service has been first rendered and then with his right hand he gave a couple of slaps on his left shoulder and with one spring the ape perched himself upon it and putting his mouth to his master's ear began chattering his teeth rapidly and having kept this up as long as one would be saying a credo 
with another spring he brought himself to the ground and the same instant master pedro ran in great haste and fell upon his knees before don quixote and embracing his legs exclaimed these legs do i embrace as i would embrace the two pillars of hercules o illustrious reviver of knight-errantry so long consigned to oblivion o never yet duly extolled knight don quixote of la mancha courage of the faint-hearted prop of the tottering arm of the fallen staff and counsel of all who are unfortunate don quixote was thunderstruck sancho astounded the cousin staggered the page astonished the man from the braying town agape the landlord in perplexity and in short every one amazed at the words of the puppet showman who went on to say and thou worthy sancho panza the best squire and squire to the best knight in the world be of good cheer for thy good wife teresa is well and she is at this moment hackling a pound of flax and more by token she has at her left hand a jug with a broken spout that holds a good drop of wine with which she solaces herself at her work that i can well believe said sancho she is a lucky one and if it was not for her jealousy i would not change her for the giantess andandona who by my master's account was a very clever and worthy woman my teresa is one of those that won't let themselves want for anything though their heirs may have to pay for it now i declare said don quixote he who reads much and travels much sees and knows a great deal i say so because what amount of persuasion could have persuaded me that there are apes in the world that can divine as i have seen now with my own eyes for i am that very don quixote of la mancha this worthy animal refers to though he has gone rather too far in my praise but whatever i may be i thank heaven that it has endowed me with a tender and compassionate heart always disposed to do good to all and harm to none if i had money said the page i would ask senor ape what will happen to me in the peregrination i am making to this master pedro who had by this time risen from don quixote's feet replied i have already said that this little beast gives no answer as to the future but if he did not having money would be of no consequence for to oblige senor don quixote here present i would give up all the profits in the world and now because i have promised it and to afford him pleasure i will set up my show and offer entertainment to all who are in the inn without any charge whatever as soon as he heard this the landlord delighted beyond measure pointed out a place where the show might be fixed which was done at once don quixote was not very well satisfied with the divinations of the ape as he did not think it proper that an ape should divine anything either past or future so while master pedro was arranging the show he retired with sancho into a corner of the stable where without being overheard by any one he said to him look here sancho i have been seriously thinking over this ape's extraordinary gift and have come to the conclusion that beyond doubt this master pedro his master has a pack tacit or express with the devil if the packet is expressed from the devil said sancho it must be a very dirty packet no doubt but what good can it do master pedro to have such packets thou dost not understand me sancho said don quixote i only mean he must have made some compact with the devil to infuse this power into the ape that he may get his living and after he has grown rich he will give him his soul which is what the enemy of mankind wants this i am led to believe by observing that the ape only answers about things past or present and the devil's knowledge extends no further for the future he knows only by guesswork and that not always for it is reserved for god alone to know the times and the seasons and for him there is neither past nor future all is present this being as it is it is clear that this ape speaks by the spirit of the devil and i am astonished they have not denounced him to the holy office and put him to the question and forced it out of him by whose virtue it is that he divines because it is certain this ape is not an astrologer neither his master nor he sets up or knows how to set up those figures they call judiciary which are now so common in spain that there is not a jade or page or old cobbler that will not undertake to set up a figure as readily as pick up a knave of cards from the ground bringing to naught the marvellous truth of the science by their lies and ignorance i know of a lady who asked one of these figure schemers whether her little lap-dog would be in pup and would breed and how many and of what colour the little pups would be to which senor astrologer after having set up his figure made answer that the bitch would be in pup and would drop three pups one green another bright red and the third party coloured provided she conceived between eleven and twelve either of the day or night and on a monday or saturday 
But as things turned out, two days after this, the bitch died of a surfeit, and Señor Planet Ruler had the credit all over the place of being a most profound astrologer, as most of these planet rulers have. Still, said Sancho, I would be glad if your worship would make Master Pedro ask his ape whether what happened your worship in the cave of Montesinos is true. For begging your worship's pardon, I, for my part, take it to have been all flam and lies, or at any rate something you dreamt. That may be, replied Don Quixote. However, I will do what you suggest, though I have my own scruples about it. At this point, Master Pedro came up in quest of Don Quixote, to tell him the show was now ready, and to come and see it, for it was worth seeing. Don Quixote explained his wish, and begged him to ask his ape at once to tell him whether certain things which had happened to him in the cave of Montesinos were dreams or realities, for to him they appeared to partake of both. Upon this, Master Pedro, without answering, went back to fetch the ape, and having placed it in front of Don Quixote and Sancho, said, See here, senor ape, this gentleman wishes to know whether certain things which happened to him in the cave, called the cave of Montesinos, were false or true. On his making the usual sign, the ape mounted on his left shoulder, and seemed to whisper in his ear, and Master Pedro said at once, The ape says that the things you saw, or that happened to you in that cave, are part of them, false, part true, and that he only knows this and no more as regards this question. But if your worship wishes to know more, on Friday next he will answer all that may be asked him, for his virtue is at present exhausted, and will not return to him till Friday, as he has said. Did I not say, senor, said Sancho, that I could not bring myself to believe that all your worship said about the adventures in the cave was true, or even the half of it? The course of events will tell, Sancho, replied Don Quixote, time that discloses all things leaves nothing that it does not drag into the light of day, though it be buried in the bosom of the earth. But enough of that for the present. Let us go and see Master Pedro's show, for I am sure there must be something novel in it. Something, said Master Pedro. This show of mine has sixty thousand novel things in it. Let me tell you, Senor Don Quixote, it is one of the best worth seeing things in the world this day. But operibus credite et non verbis, and now let's get to work, for it is growing late, and we have a great deal to do and to say and show. Don Quixote and Sancho obeyed him, and went to where the show was already put up and uncovered, set all around with lighted wax tapers, which made it look splendid and bright. When they came to it, Master Pedro ensconced himself inside it, for it was he who had to work the puppets, and a boy, a servant of his, posted himself outside to act as showman and explain the mysteries of the exhibition, having a wand in his hand to point to the figures as they came out. And so, all who were in the inn being arranged in front of the show, some of them standing, and Don Quixote, Sancho, the page and cousin, accommodated with the best places, the interpreter began to say what he will hear or see who reads or hears the next chapter. End of Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 25 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 26 Of the Ingenious Gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha By Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra Translated by John Ormsby, 1829 to 1895. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 26. Wherein is continued the droll adventure of the puppet showman, together with other things in truth right good. All were silent, Tyrians and Trojans. I mean, all who were watching the show were hanging on the lips of the interpreter of its wonders, when drums and trumpets were heard to sound inside it, and cannon to go off. The noise was soon over, and then the boy lifted up his voice and said, This true story which is here represented to your worships is taken word for word from the French chronicles, and from the Spanish ballads that are in everybody's mouth and in the mouth of the boys about the streets. Its subject is a release by Senor Don Gaiferos of his wife Melisendra, when a captive in Spain at the hands of the Moors in the city of Sansuena, for so they called then what is now called Saragossa. And there you may see how Don Gaiferos is playing at the tables just as they sing it. At tables playing Don Gaiferos sits, for Melisendra is forgotten now. And that personage who appears there with a crown on his head and a scepter in his hand is the Emperor Charlemagne, the supposed father of Melisendra, who, angered to see his son-in-law's inaction and unconcern, comes in to chide him. 
and observe with what vehemence and energy he chides him so that you would fancy he was going to give him half a dozen raps with his sceptre and indeed there are authors who say he did give them and sound ones too and after having said a great deal to him about imperilling his honour by not affecting the release of his wife he said so the tale runs enough i've said see to it now observe too how the emperor turns away and leaves don gaiferos fuming and you see now how in a burst of anger he flings the table and the board far from him and calls in haste for his armour and asks his cousin don roland for the loan of his sword durandania and how don roland refuses to lend it offering him his company in the difficult enterprise he is undertaking but he in his valour and anger will not accept it and says that he alone will suffice to rescue his wife even though she were imprisoned deep in the centre of the earth and with this he retires to arm himself and set out on his journey at once now let your worships turn your eyes to that tower that appears there which is supposed to be one of the towers of the alcazar of saragossa now called the aljaferia that lady who appears on that balcony dressed in moorish fashion is the peerless melisendra for many a time she used to gaze from thence upon the road to france and seek consolation in her captivity by thinking of paris and her husband observe too a new incident which now occurs such as perhaps never was seen do you not see that moor who silently and stealthily with his finger on his lip approaches melisendra from behind observe now how he prints a kiss upon her lips and what a hurry she is in to spit and wipe them with the white sleeve of her smock and how she bewails herself and tears her fair hair as though it were to blame for the wrong observe too that the stately moor who is in that corridor is king marsilio of sansuena who having seen the moor's insolence at once orders him though his kinsman and a great favourite of his to be seized and given two hundred lashes while carried through the streets of the city according to custom with criers going before him and officers of justice behind and here you see them come out to execute the sentence although the offence has been scarcely committed for among the moors there are no indictments nor remands as with us here don quixote called out child child go straight on with your story and don't run into curves and slants for to establish a fact clearly there is need of a great deal of proof and confirmation and said master pedro from within boy stick to your text and do as the gentleman bids you it's the best plan keep to your plain song and don't attempt harmonies for they are apt to break down from being over fine i will said the boy and he went on to say this figure that you see here on horseback covered with a gascon cloak is don gaiferos himself whom his wife now avenged of the insult of the amorous moor and taking her stand on the balcony of the tower with a calmer and more tranquil countenance has perceived without recognizing him and she addresses her husband supposing him to be some traveller and holds with him all that conversation and colloquy in the ballad that runs if you sir knight to france are bound o for gaiferos ask which i do not repeat here because prolixity begets disgust suffice it to observe how don gaiferos discovers himself and that by her joyful gestures melisendra shows us she has recognized him and what is more we now see she lowers herself from the balcony to place herself on the haunches of her good husband's horse but ah unhappy lady the edge of her petticoat has caught on one of the bars of the balcony and she is left hanging in the air unable to reach the ground but you see how compassionate heaven sends aid in our sorest need don gaiferos advances and without minding whether the rich petticoat is torn or not he seizes her and by force brings her to the ground and then with one jerk places her on the haunches of his horse a straddle like a man and bids her hold on tight and clasp her arms round his neck crossing them on his breast so as not to fall for the lady melisendra was not used to that style of riding you see too how the neighing of the horse shows his satisfaction with the gallant and beautiful burden he bears in his lord and lady you see how they wheel round and quit the city and in joy and gladness take the road to paris go in peace o peerless pair of true lovers may you reach your longed for fatherland in safety and may fortune interpose no impediment to your prosperous journey may the eyes of your friends and kinsmen behold you enjoying peace and tranquillity the remaining days of your life and that they may be as many as those of nestor here master pedro called out again and said simplicity boy none of your high flights all affectation is bad 
The interpreter made no answer, but went on to say, There was no want of idle eyes that see everything, to see Melisendra come down and mount, and word was brought to King Marsilio, who at once gave orders to sound the alarm. And see what a stir there is, and how the city is drowned, with the sound of bells pealing in the towers of all the mosques. Nay, nay, said Don Quixote at this. On that point of the bells, Master Pedro is very inaccurate, for bells are not in use among the Moors, only kettle drums, and a kind of small trumpet somewhat like our clarion. To ring bells this way in Sansuena is unquestionably a great absurdity. On hearing this, Master Pedro stopped ringing and said, Don't look into trifles, Señor Don Quixote, or want to have things up to a pitch of perfection that is out of reach. Are there not almost every day a thousand comedies represented all round us, full of thousands of inaccuracies and absurdities, and for all that they have a successful run, and are listened to not only with applause, but with admiration and all the rest of it? Go on, boy, and don't mind, for so long as I fill my pouch, no matter if I show as many inaccuracies as there are motes in a sunbeam. True enough, said Don Quixote, and the boy went on. See what a numerous and glittering crowd of horsemen issues from the city in pursuit of the two faithful lovers. What a blowing of trumpets there is, what sounding of horns, what beating of drums and tabors. I fear me they will overtake them and bring them back tied to the tail of their own horse, which would be a dreadful sight. Don Quixote, however, seeing such a swarm of moors and hearing such a din, thought it would be right to aid the fugitives, and standing up he exclaimed in a loud voice, Never while I live! Will I permit foul play to be practiced in my presence on such a famous knight and fearless lover as Don Gaiferos? Halt, ill-born rabble! Follow him not, nor pursue him, or ye will have to reckon with me in battle. And suiting the action to the word, he drew his sword, and with one bound placed himself close to the show, and with unexampled rapidity and fury began to shower down blows on the puppet troop of Moors, knocking over some, decapitating others, maiming this one and demolishing that and among many more he delivered one downstroke which if master pedro had not ducked made himself small and got out of the way would have sliced off his head as easily as if it had been made of almond paste master pedro kept shouting hold hard senor don quixote can't you see they're not real moors you're knocking down and killing and destroying but only little pasteboard figures look sinner that i am how you're wrecking and ruining all that i'm worth but in spite of this, Don Quixote did not leave off discharging a continuous rain of cuts, slashes, downstrokes, and backstrokes, and at length, in less than the space of two credos, he brought the whole show to the ground, with all its fittings and figures shivered and knocked to pieces, King Marsilio badly wounded, and the Emperor Charlemagne with his crown and head split in two. The whole audience was thrown into confusion. The ape fled to the roof of the inn, the cousin was frightened and even Sancho Panza himself was in mighty fear, for, as he swore after the storm was over, he had never seen his master in such a furious passion. The complete destruction of the show being thus accomplished, Don Quixote became a little calmer, said, I wish I had here before me now all those who do not or will not believe how useful knights errant are in the world. Just think, if I had not been here present, what would have become of the brave Don Gaiferos and the fair Melisandra? Depend upon it, by this time those dogs would have overtaken them and inflicted some outrage upon them. So then, long live knight errantry beyond everything living on earth this day. Let it live and welcome, said Master Pedro at this in a feeble voice, and let me die, for I am so unfortunate that I can say with King Don Rodrigo, yesterday was I lord of Spain, today I have not a turret left that I may call mine own. Not half an hour, nay, barely a minute ago, I saw myself lord of kings and emperors, with my stables filled with countless horses, and my trunks and bags with gay dresses unnumbered, and now I find myself ruined and laid low, destitute and a beggar, and above all without my ape, for by my faith my teeth will have to sweat for it before I have him caught. And all through the reckless fury of Sir Knight here, who they say protects the fatherless and rights wrongs, and does other charitable deeds but whose generous intentions have been found wanting in my case only blessed and praised be the highest heavens verily knight of the rueful figure he must be to have disfigured mine sancho panza was touched by master pedro's words and said to him don't weep and lament master pedro you break my heart let me tell you my master don quixote is so catholic and scrupulous a christian 
that if he can make out that he has done you any wrong he will own it and be willing to pay for it and make it good and something over and above only let senor don quixote pay me for some part of the work he has destroyed said master pedro and i would be content and his worship would ease his conscience for he cannot be saved who keeps what is another's against the owner's will and makes no restitution that is true said don quixote but at present i am not aware that i have got anything of yours master pedro what returned master pedro and these relics lying here on the bare hard ground what scattered and shattered them but the invincible strength of that mighty arm and whose were the bodies they belonged to but mine and what did i get my living by but by them now am i fully convinced said don quixote of what i had many a time before believed that the enchanters who persecute me do nothing more than put figures like these before my eyes and then change and turn them into what they please in truth and earnest i assure you gentlemen who now hear me that to me everything that has taken place here seemed to take place literally that melisendra was melisendra don gaiferos don gaiferos marsilio marsilio and charlemagne charlemagne that was why my anger was roused and to be faithful to my calling as a knight-errant i sought to give aid and protection to those who fled and with this good intention i did what you have seen if the result has been the opposite of what i intended it is no fault of mine but of those wicked beings that persecute me but for all that i am willing to condemn myself in cost for this error of mine though it did not proceed from malice let master pedro see what he wants for the spoiled figures for i agree to pay it at once in good and current money of castile master pedro made him a bow saying i expected no less of the rare christianity of the valiant don quixote of la mancha true helper and protector of all destitute and needy vagabonds master landlord here and the great sancho panza shall be the arbitrators and appraisers between your worship and me of what these dilapidated figures are worth or may be worth the landlord and sancho consented and then master pedro picked up from the ground king marsilio of saragossa with his head off and said here you see how impossible it is to restore this king to his former state so i think saving your better judgments that for his death decease and demise four reals and a half may be given me proceed said don quixote well then for this cleavage from top to bottom continued master pedro taking up the split emperor charlemagne it would not be much if i were to ask five reals and a quarter it's not little said sancho nor is it much said the landlord make it even and say five reals let him have the whole five and a quarter said don quixote for the sum total of this notable disaster does not stand on a quarter more or less and make an end of it quickly master pedro for it's getting on to supper time and i have some hints of hunger for this figure said master pedro that is without a nose and wants an eye and is the fair melisendra i ask and i am reasonable in my charge two reals and twelve maravedis the very devil must be in it said don quixote if melisendra and her husband are not by this time at least on the french border for the horse they rode on seemed to me to fly rather than gallop so you needn't try to sell me the cat for the hare showing me here a noseless melisendra when she is now may be enjoying herself at her ease with her husband in france god help every one to his own master pedro and let us all proceed fairly and honestly and now go on master pedro perceiving that don quixote was beginning to wander and returned to his original fancy was not disposed to let him escape so he said to him this cannot be melisendra but must be one of the damsels that waited on her so if i'm given sixty maravedis for her i'll be content and sufficiently paid and so he went on putting values on ever so many more smashed figures which after the two arbitrators had adjusted them to the satisfaction of both parties came to forty reals and three quarters and over and above this sum which sancho at once dispersed master pedro asked for two reals for his trouble in catching the ape let him have them sancho said don quixote not to catch the ape but to get drunk and two hundred would i give this minute for the good news to any one who could tell me positively that the lady doña melisandra and senor don gaiferos were now in france and with their own people no one could tell us that better than my ape said master pedro but there's no devil that could catch him now i suspect however that affection and hunger will drive him to come looking for me to-night but to-morrow will soon be here and we shall see in short the puppet show storm passed off and all supped in peace and good fellowship at don quixote's expense 
for he was the height of generosity before it was daylight the man with the lances and halberds took his departure and soon after daybreak the cousin and the page came to bid don quixote farewell the former returning home the latter resuming his journey towards which to help him don quixote gave him twelve reals master pedro did not care to engage in any more palaver with don quixote whom he knew right well so he rose before the sun and having got together the remains of his show and caught his ape he too went off to seek his adventures the landlord who did not know don quixote was as much astonished at his mad freaks as at his generosity to conclude sancho by his master's orders paid him very liberally and taking leave of him they quitted the inn at about eight in the morning and took to the road where we will leave them to pursue their journey for this is necessary in order to allow certain other matters to be set forth which are required to clear up this famous history end of volume two part two chapter twenty six recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume two part two chapter twenty seven of the ingenious gentleman don quixote of la mancha by miguel de cervantes saavedra translated by john ormsby eighteen twenty nine to eighteen ninety five this librivox recording is in the public domain volume two part two chapter twenty seven wherein it is shown who master pedro and his ape were together with the mishap don quixote had in the braying adventure which he did not conclude as he would have liked or as he had expected cid hamet the chronicler of this great history begins this chapter with these words i swear as a catholic christian with regard to which his translator says that cid hamet swearing as a catholic christian he being as no doubt he was a moor only meant that just as a catholic christian taking an oath swears or ought to swear what is true and tell the truth in what he avers so he was telling the truth as much as if he swore as a catholic christian in all he chose to write about quixote especially in declaring who master pedro was and what was the divining ape that astonished all the villages with his divinations he says then that he who has read the first part of this history will remember well enough the Hines de pasamonte whom with other galley slaves don quixote set free in the sierra morena a kindness for which he afterwards got poor thanks and worse payment from that evil-minded ill-conditioned set this Hines de pasamonte don Hinesillo de parapia don quixote called him it was that stole dapple from sancho panza which because by the fault of the printers neither the how nor the when was stated in the first part has been a puzzle to a good many people who attribute to the bad memory of the author what was the error of the press in fact however Inez stole him while sancho panza was asleep on his back adopting the plan and device that brunello had course to when he stole sacripante's horse from between his legs at the siege of albraca and as has been told sancho afterwards recovered him this Hines, then afraid of being caught by the officers of justice who were looking for him to punish him for his numberless rascalities and offences which were so many and so great that he himself wrote a big book giving an account of them resolved to shift his quarters into the kingdom of aragon and cover up his left eye and take up the trade of a puppet showman for this as well as juggling he knew how to practise to perfection from some released christians returning from barbary it so happened he bought the ape which he taught to mount upon his shoulder on his making a certain sign and to whisper or seem to do so in his ear thus prepared before entering any village whither he was bound with his show and his ape he used to inform himself at the nearest village or from the most likely person he could find as to what particular things had happened there and to whom and bearing them well in mind the first thing he did was to exhibit his show sometimes one story sometimes another but all lively amusing and familiar as soon as the exhibition was over he brought forward the accomplishments of his ape assuring the public that he divined all the past and the present but as to the future he had no skill for each question answered he asked two reals and for some he made a reduction just as he happened to feel the pulse of the questioners and when now and then he came to houses where things that he knew of had happened to the people living there 
even if they did not ask him a question not caring to pay for it he would make the sign to the ape and then declare that it had said so and so which fitted the case exactly in this way he acquired a prodigious name and all ran after him on other occasions being very crafty he would answer in such a way that the answers suited the questions and as no one cross-questioned him or pressed him to tell how his ape divined he made fools of them all and filled his pouch the instant he entered the inn he knew don quixote and sancho and with that knowledge it was easy for him to astonish them and all who were there but it would have cost him dear had don quixote brought down his hand a little lower when he cut off king marsilio's head and destroyed all his horsemen as related in the preceding chapter so much for master pedro and his ape and now to return to don quixote of la mancha after he had left the inn he determined to visit first of all the banks of the ebro and that neighbourhood before entering the city of saragossa for the ample time there was still to spare before the jousts left him enough for all with this object in view he followed the road and travelled along it for two days without meeting any adventure worth committing to writing until on the third day as he was ascending a hill he heard a great noise of drums trumpets and musket shots at first he imagined some regiment of soldiers was passing that way and to see them he spurred rocinante and mounted the hill on reaching the top he saw at the foot of it over two hundred men as it seemed to him armed with weapons of various sorts lances crossbows partisans halberds and pikes and a few muskets and a great many bucklers he descended the slope and approached the band near enough to see distinctly the flags make out the colours and distinguish the devices they bore especially one on a standard or ensign of white satin on which there was painted a very lifelike style and ass like a little sard with its head up its mouth open and its tongue out as if it were in the act and attitude of braying and round it were inscribed in large characters these two lines they did not bray in vain or alcades twain from this device don quixote concluded that these people must be from the braying town and he said so to sancho explaining to him what was written on the standard at the same time he observed that the man who had told them about the matter was wrong in saying that the two who brayed were regidors for according to the lines of the standard there were alcades to which sancho replied senor there's nothing to stick at in that for maybe the regidors who brayed then came to be alcades of their town afterwards and so they may go by both titles moreover it has nothing to do with the truth of the story whether the brayers were alcades or regidors provided at any rate they did bray for an alcade is just as likely to bray as a regidor they perceived in short clearly that the town which had been twitted had turned out to do battle with some other that had jeered it more than was fair or neighbourly don quixote proceeded to join them not a little to sancho's uneasiness for he never relished mixing himself up in expeditions of that sort the members of the troop received him into the midst of them taking him to be some one who was on their side don quixote putting up his visor advanced with an easy bearing and demeanour to the standard with the ass and all the chief men of the army gathered round him to look at him staring at him with the usual amazement that everybody felt on seeing him for the first time don quixote seeing them examining him so attentively and that none of them spoke to him or put any question to him determined to take advantage of their silence so breaking his own he lifted up his voice and said worthy sirs i entreat you as earnestly as i can not to interrupt an argument i wish to address to you until you find it displeases or wearies you and if that come to pass on the slightest hint you give me i will put a seal upon my lips and a gag upon my tongue they all bade him say what he liked for they would listen to him willingly with this permission don quixote went on to say i sirs am a knight-errant whose calling is that of arms and whose profession is to protect those who require protection and give help to such as stand in need of it some days ago i became acquainted with your misfortune and the cause which impels you to take up arms again and again to revenge yourselves upon your enemies and having many times thought over your business in my mind i find that according to the laws of combat you are mistaken in holding yourselves insulted for a private individual cannot insult an entire community unless it be by defying it collectively as a traitor because he cannot tell who in particular 
is guilty of the treason for which he defies it of this we have an example in don diego ordonez de lara who defied the whole town of zamora because he did not know that villido dolfos alone had committed the treachery of slaying his king and therefore he defied them all and the vengeance and the reply concerned all though to be sure senor don diego went rather too far indeed very much beyond the limits of a defiance for he had no occasion to defy the dead or the waters or the fishes or those yet unborn and all the rest of it as set forth but let that pass for when anger breaks out there's no father governor or bridle to check the tongue the case being then that no one person can insult a kingdom province city state or entire community it is clear there is no reason for going out to avenge the defiance of such an insult inasmuch as it is not one a fine thing it would be if the people of the clock town were to be at loggerheads every moment with every one who called them by that name or the casoleros berengeneros bayonatos jaboneros or the bearers of all the other names and titles that are always in the mouth of the boys and common people it would be a nice business indeed if all these illustrious cities were to take huff and revenge themselves and go about perpetually making trombones of their swords in every petty quarrel no no god forbid there are four things for which sensible men and well-ordered states ought to take up arms draw their swords and risk their persons lives and properties the first is to defend the catholic faith the second to defend one's life which is in accordance with natural and divine law the third in defence of one's honour family and property the fourth in the service of one's king in a just war and if to these we choose to add a fifth which may be included in the second in defence of one's country to these five as it were capital causes there may be added some others that may be just and reasonable and make it a duty to take up arms but to take them up for trifles and things to laugh at and be amused by rather than offended looks as though he who did so was altogether wanting in common sense moreover to take an unjust revenge and there cannot be any just one is directly opposed to the sacred law that we acknowledge wherein we are commanded to do good to our enemies and to love them that hate us a command which though it seems somewhat difficult to obey is only so to those who have in them less of god than of the world and more of the flesh than of the spirit for jesus christ god and true man who never lied and could not and cannot lie said as our lawgiver that his yoke was easy and his burden light he would not therefore have laid any command upon us that it was impossible to obey thus sirs you are bound to keep quiet by human and divine law the devil take me said sancho to himself at this but this master of mine is a theologian or if not faith he's as like one as one egg is like another don quixote stopped to take breath and observing that silence was still preserved had a mind to continue his discourse and would have done so had not sancho interposed with his smartness for he seeing his master pause took the lead saying my lord don quixote of la mancha who once was called the knight of the rueful countenance but now is called the knight of the lions is a gentleman of great discretion who knows latin and his mother tongue like a bachelor and in everything that he deals with or advises proceeds like a good soldier and has all the laws and ordinances of what they call combat at his fingers ends so you have nothing to do but to let yourselves be guided by what he says and on my head be it if it is wrong besides which you have been told that it is folly to take offence at merely hearing a bray i remember when i was a boy i brayed as often as i had a fancy without any one hindering me and so elegantly and naturally that when i brayed all the asses in the town would bray but i was none the less for that the son of my parents who were greatly respected and though i was envied because of the gift by more than one of the high and mighty ones of the town i did not care two farthings for it and that you may say i am telling the truth wait a bit and listen for this art like swimming once learnt is never forgotten and then taking hold of his nose he began to bray so vigorously that all the valleys around rang again one of those however that stood near him fancying he was mocking them lifted up a long staff he had in his hand and smote him such a blow with it that sancho dropped helpless to the ground don quixote seeing him so roughly handled attacked the man who had struck him lance in hand but so many thrust themselves between them that he could not avenge him far from it finding a shower of stones rained upon him 
and crossbows and muskets unnumbered levelled at him he wheeled rocinante round and as fast as his best gallop could take him fled from the midst of them commending himself to god with all his heart to deliver him out of this peril in dread every step of some ball coming in at his back and coming out at his breast and every minute drawing his breath to see whether it had gone from him the members of the band however were satisfied with seeing him take to flight and did not fire on him they put up sancho scarcely restored to his senses on his ass and let him go after his master not that he was sufficiently in his wits to guide the beast but dapple followed the footsteps of rocinante from whom he could not remain a moment separated don quixote having got some way off looked back and seeing sancho coming waited for him as he perceived that no one followed him the men of the troop stood their ground till night and as the enemy did not come out to battle they returned to their town exulting and had they been aware of the ancient custom of the greeks they would have erected a trophy on the spot end of volume two part two chapter twenty seven recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume two part two chapter twenty eight of the ingenious gentleman don quixote of la mancha by miguel de cervantes saavedra translated by john ormsby eighteen twenty nine to eighteen ninety five this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume two part two chapter twenty eight of matters that benengeli says he who reads them will know if he reads them with attention when the brave man flees treachery is manifest and it is for wise men to reserve themselves for better occasions this proved to be the case with don quixote who giving way before the fury of the townsfolk and the hostile intentions of the angry troop took to flight and without a thought of sancho or the danger in which he was leaving him retreated to such a distance as he thought made him safe sancho lying across his ass followed him as has been said and at length came up having by this time recovered his senses and on joining him let himself drop off dapple at rocinante's feet sore bruised and belaboured don quixote dismounted to examine his wounds but finding him whole from head to foot he said to him angrily enough in an evil hour didst thou take to braying sancho where hast thou learned that it is well done to mention the rope in the house of the man that has been hanged to the music of brays what harmonies couldst thou expect to get but cudgels give thanks to god sancho that they signed the cross on thee just now with a stick and did not mark thee per signum crucis with a cutlass i am not equal to answering said sancho for i feel as if i was speaking through my shoulders let us mount and get away from this i'll keep from braying but not from saying that knights-errant fly and leave their good squires to be pounded like privet or made meal of at the hands of their enemies he does not fly who retires returned don quixote for i would have thee know sancho that the valour which is not based upon a foundation of prudence is called rashness and the exploits of the rash man are to be attributed rather to good fortune than to courage and so i own that i retired but not that i fled and therein i have followed the example of many valiant men who have reserved themselves for better times the histories are full of instances of this but as it would not be any good to thee or pleasure to me i will not recount them to thee now sancho was by this time mounted with the help of don quixote who then himself mounted rocinante and at a leisurely pace they proceeded to take shelter in a grove which was in sight about a quarter of a league off every now and then sancho gave vent to deep sighs and dismal groans and on don quixote asking him what caused such acute suffering he replied that from the end of his backbone up to the nape of his neck he was so sore that it nearly drove him out of his senses the cause of that soreness said don quixote will be no doubt that the staff wherewith they smote thee being a very long one it caught thee all down the back where all the parts that are sore are situated and had it reached any further thou wouldst be sorer still by god said sancho your worship has relieved me of a great doubt and cleared up the point for me in elegant style body of me is the cause of my soreness such a mystery that there's any need to tell me i am sore everywhere the staff hit me if it was my ankles that pained me there might be something in going divining why they did but it is not much to divine that i am sore where they thrashed me 
by my faith master mine the ills of others hang by a hair every day i am discovering more and more how little i have to hope for from keeping company with your worship for if this time you have allowed me to be drubbed the next time or a hundred times more will have the blanketings of the other day all over again and all the other pranks which if they have fallen on my shoulders now will be thrown in my teeth by and by i would do a great deal better if i was not an ignorant brute that will never do any good all my life i would do a great deal better i say to go home to my wife and children and support them and bring them up on what god may please to give me instead of following your worship along roads that lead nowhere and paths that are none at all with little to drink and less to eat and then when it comes to sleeping measure out seven feet on the earth brother squire and if that's not enough for you take as many more you may have it all your own way and stretch yourself to your heart's content oh that i could see burnt and turned to ashes the first man that meddled with knight-errantry or at any rate the first who chose to be squire to such fools as all the knights-errant of past times must have been of those of the present day i say nothing because as your worship is one of them i respect them and because i know your worship knows a point more than the devil in all you say and think i would lay a good wager with you sancho said don quixote that now that you are talking on without any one to stop you you don't feel a pain in your whole body talk away my son say whatever comes into your head or mouth for so long as you feel no pain the irritation your impertinences give me will be a pleasure to me and if you are so anxious to go home to your wife and children god forbid that i should prevent you you have money of mine see how long it is since we left our village this third time and how much you can and ought to earn every month and pay yourself out of your own hand when i worked for tom carrasco the father of the bachelor samson carrasco that your worship knows replied sancho i used to earn two ducats a month besides my food i can't tell what i can earn with your worship though i know a knight-errant squire has harder times of it than he who works for a farmer for after all we who work for farmers however much we toil all day at the worst at night we have our ola supper and sleep in a bed which i have not slept in since i have been in your worship's service if it wasn't a short time we were in don diego de miranda's house and the feast i had with the skimmings i took off camacho's pots and what i ate drank and slept in basilio's house all the rest of the time i had been sleeping on the hard ground under the open sky exposed to what they call the inclemencies of heaven keeping life in me with scraps of cheese and crusts of bread and drinking water either from the brooks or from the springs we come to on these by-paths we travel i own sancho said don quixote that all thou sayest is true how much thinkest thou ought i to give thee over and above what tom carrasco gave thee i think said sancho that if your worship was to add on two reals a month i'd consider myself well paid that is as far as the wages of my labour go but to make up to me for your worship's pledge and promise to me to give me the government of an island it would be fair to add six reals more making thirty in all very good said don quixote it is twenty-five days since we left our village so reckon up sancho according to the wages you have made out for yourself and see how much i owe you in proportion and pay yourself as i said before out of your own hand oh body of me said sancho but your worship is very much out in that reckoning for when it comes to the promise of the island we must count from the day your worship promised it to me to this present hour we are at now well how long is it sancho since i promised it to you said don quixote if i remember rightly said sancho it must be over twenty years three days more or less don quixote gave himself a great slap on the forehead and began to laugh heartily and said why i have not been wandering either in the sierra morena or in the whole course of our sallies but barely two months and thou sayest sancho that it is twenty years since i promised thee the island i believe now thou wouldst have all the money thou hast of mine go in thy wages if so and if that be thy pleasure i give it to thee now once and for all and much good may it do thee for so long as i see myself rid of such a good-for-nothing squire i'll be glad to be left a pauper without a rap but tell me thou perverter of the squirely rules of knight-errantry where hast thou ever seen or read that any knight-errant squire made terms with his lord you must give me so much a month for serving you plunge scoundrel rogue monster for such i take thee to be plunge i say into the mare magnum of their history 
and if thou shalt find that any squire ever said or thought what thou hast said now i will let thee nail it on my forehead and give me over and above four sound slaps in the face turn the rein or the halter of thy dapple and be gone home but one single step further thou shalt not make in my company o oh, bread thanklessly received o oh, promises ill bestowed o oh, man more beast than human being now when i was about to raise thee to such a position that in spite of thy wife they would call thee my lord thou art leaving me thou art going now when i had a firm and fixed intention of making thee lord of the best island in the world well as thou myself hast said before now honey is not for the mouth of the ass ass thou art ass thou wilt be and ass thou wilt end when the course of thy life is run for i know it will come to its close before thou dost perceive or discern that thou art a beast sancho regarded don quixote earnestly while he was giving him this rating and was so touched by remorse that the tears came to his eyes and in a piteous and broken voice he said to him master mine i confess that to be a complete ass all i want is a tail if your worship will only fix one on to me i'll look on it as rightly placed and i'll serve you as an ass all the remaining days of my life forgive me and have pity on my folly and remember i know but little and if i talk much it's more from infirmity than malice but he who sins and mends commends himself to god i should have been surprised sancho said don quixote if thou hadst not introduced some bit of a proverb into thy speech well well i forgive thee provided thou dost mend and not show thyself in future so fond of thine own interest but try to be of good cheer and take heart and encourage thyself to look forward to the fulfilment of my promises which by being delayed does not become impossible sancho said he would do so and keep up his heart as best he could they then entered the grove and don quixote settled himself at the foot of an elm and sancho at that of a beech for trees of this kind and others like them always have feet but no hands sancho passed the night in pain for with the evening dews the blow of the staff made itself felt all the more don quixote passed it in his never-failing meditations but for all that they had some winks of sleep and with the appearance of daylight they pursued their journey in quest of the banks of the famous ebro where that befell them which will be told in the following chapter end of volume two part two chapter twenty eight recording by expatriate in bangor maine